I think I, you know, when I said what I said on, uh, about Norman Lamont, it was a joke that occurred to me that evening and I thought um, it would get a laugh. But for and, those in the audience who don't know what it was, what was the joke? OK, well, just where you cut, <laughs> I said, um, as a matter of fact, I've just been fisting Norman Lamont. <laughs> As a schoolboy, Julian stood out from the crowd. He knew he was gay from the age of eight, and he became kind of knowingly camp and walked around using words like forsooth and wearing weird socks and things. From the age of 11, Julian attended a strict Catholic school run by monks. Here, Julian and his best friend Nick, also gay, fell victims to bullies. We were different, we were outsiders, we were marginalised. It was a lot of verbal abuse. Puff, Queer, Nancy, Quentin. It did become quite nasty. And the abuse didn't just come from fellow pupils. There were occasions when there was a big roundup of people and they would all be beaten. They'd have to line up and to get a beating out of the cricket bat. He would always try and be the last one because by the end of it, um, he would hope that the teacher was quite tired. He didn't say anything because it was so difficult to explain. We didn't know at the time. It never, no. it wasn't a, a thing we were aware of. He never brought that problem home. I had absolutely no idea. You sort of blame yourself. You, you should have known what was happening. You should have recognised that your child was in some ways unhappy. Putting behind him the painful experiences of school, at university, Julian met a more accepting crowd and discovered cabaret. He also had his first and only love affair with a woman. I knew Julian um, when he was straight. He was having a relationship with a woman for a start. He was open to any kind of relationship, as long as it was a good, worthwhile one. After several years, the relationship ended. I think he was just doing what was expected of him. And I think he probably was sort of in love, but I knew it wasn't right. As he became famous for being one of the few openly gay comics on British TV, Julian's unique humour was a big draw. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. You're receiving me at the rear, that's good. In 1989, Julian landed his first presenting job, co-hosting the game show Trick or Treat with Mike Smith. We didn't put Julian Clary on it because of a statement. We just thought he was a good entertainer and would be a bit different. I'm coming on as a wrestler next week. <laughs> but not everyone took to him. Now, would you say that Trick or Treat's family view him with this, with this guy who's obviously prancing? Poor Finney, really. I'm going to do a new quiz show called Small Minded Bigotry and Jimmy's going to star in it. <laughs> Is this man too outrageous for British television? He's paint and powdered like a queer as far as I'm concerned. Despite the backlash, Julian remained in demand. Look at your hair, it's an outrage. <laughs> he also met his soulmate, Christopher. Christopher was a, a very gentle, nice person. He was a good partner with Julian, very good. Soon after they met, though, Christopher broke the devastating news that he was dying from AIDS. Doctors had given him just six months to live. Very difficult time for Julian because we, we knew what was ahead. It was all new to everybody at that time, you know, not many people had died of AIDS. You know, all of us didn't really have the information that people have now, so Julian was basically his, you know, his carer. He had his little world of, I mean, TV and shows and everything and the glamour, but come home and care for Christopher. Christopher died in the summer of 1991. I think he was a bit lost after Christopher died. We knew he was in pain. It was a hard time. He put one foot in front of the other, and it was hard. How did you find out that, that Christopher had AIDS? Oh, um, he told me. Um, he didn't know when I first met him. Then he disappeared for a while, and um, I wondered what had happened to him. And, and that's what had happened. And in the early 90s, AIDS was a lot still being learned about it, but it was a very sort of terrifying word that was being banded around. 
in the media and it seemed like this awful thing. Did you know much about it? Were you informed about AIDS at the time? No, I mean, I, I, um, no one. I mean, the doctors that were treating him were not very sure how to treat him, you know, and he was given so, so many drugs, you know, this sort of concoction of, of drugs. And um, I don't really think uh, Christopher or I particularly wanted to know too much, you know. We, I mean, he was very ill, and um, I was looking after him, but um, he was very cheerful about it. <clears throat> he used to... Um, he used to laugh a lot. I remember when he was given six months to live, he'd been to a hospital appointment and he'd asked them how long, and they said six months. And uh, he just laughed because it seemed so inconceivable. And uh, How did you react? Oh, I laughed with him because cause there he was standing there, you know, and the thought that they... How dare they tell him that he only had six months? In fact, he had nine months, so they were wrong. And that was, uh, that was quite important to Christopher that... Uh, was he the first sort of proper love of your life, would you say? Hmm. Yes. Yes. And you were this extraordinary carer to him. Friends of yours have said to us that you just looked after him right to the end with incredible love and care. But a devastating thing to happen to you in your life. Well, it was a great privilege, actually, to, to look after someone. Um, it was a great privilege to look after him anyway. But he didn't want to to stay at home and be ill, he wanted to travel. And, and so we went to the Maldives and we went to Portugal and we went to New York and we went to Mallorca, so. Um, what kind of man was he? Um, I can't talk about that. He was very nice, very funny. You just tapped my foot, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> then when I went to, um, to... I thought I'd do a sort of ceremony on the beach and um, I put candles and incense and uh, was having a sort of spiritual moment and uh, it was sunset. And uh, I turned around and there, were, there was a man masturbating behind me. <laughs> After three years largely off our screens following his British Comedy Awards faux pas, Julian returned to primetime TV. His new show, All Rise for Julian Clary, saw him back doing what he does best. Oh, that's kind. Thank you. I feel all moist. Quite a weird format based about him being the judge, accompanied by Jim Whitfield as his kind of like camp assistant. It was lovely to have him back again. I inadvertently touched her left breast. Doing what he does best, which is dealing with punters. It was a formula that worked. Do you want me to <laughs> Please don't touch me. He was happy to be back on TV, but I think he was also aware of the fact that he had to be grateful that he was back on TV. The TV office soon came flooding in for Julian, and he quickly moved from being shock comic to light entertainment star. Oh, no, there's been a mistake. It's all over your man-made fibre. <laughs> he's not just a stand-up comic, but he's brilliant at doing quiz shows and all of that because he actually likes... You can see he loves members of the public, and members of the public love him. You're a very modern couple, aren't you? Yes. And you're wearing a pleated skirt. <laughs> Watch it. I think the audiences know that he doesn't really mean it when he says those outrageous things. Now live, a brand new game show. Julian was suddenly allowed to be live on a Saturday night. He was trusted again. Woo! You might well woo. I think that was a big breakthrough. Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Julian Clary. You look at his CV, it is remarkable. He, is, he has done everything on every channel. He's been at peak time, late night. Would you be press <laughs> Well, what? you know, if the lights were out. <laughs> now commanding huge TV audiences, Julian's return to the limelight wasn't always plain sailing. In private, he frequently suffered from panic attacks. Uh, I think the worst panic attack he had was on television in a TV studio. I really felt for him that day. Are you all right? I'm just having a little turn. Turn meaning a kind of a, do you not feel good? A kind of panic attack turn. 
how do you get out of a panic attack or do you just have to sort of live through it and then it, you come out the other end? You can talk yourself out of it sometimes, sometimes you can't. He's a big, well-known bloke and you don't consider him suffering from anxiety or anything. I feel better if I went off for okay. one minute. All right, go off. But I think breathe. Okay. Breathe deeply. He doesn't really put himself in those situations anymore. Those days have gone. By the late 90s, as he was riding high again on TV, Julian was about to hit 40 and started to think about another role in life. I mean, I can't pass a child in the street without going all gooey and getting a twitching in the nipple region. <laughs> so I was feeling the need to father a child. In his 40s, he was quite, you know, talking about it quite a lot and adopting children, and he was getting pretty broody in, in that period. I think he'd make a really interesting and unusual parent, but also a very good one. He loves looking after people. He rescues people all the time. It would make total sense that he would love a child to nurture. He often has talked about, not recently, but over yeah. the years, quite often, yes, he would have liked to have done. His parental feelings have been channeled into his caring for his animals. In 2004, having conquered TV, Julian became a West End star, taking lead roles in the musical Taboo and later Cabaret. Every time he comes on stage, the atmosphere in the theatre changes like that, because he is the star attraction. And with Panto, Julian has found the perfect crowd for his comedy. I am the genie of the lamp. The highlight of my Christmas is seeing Julian in Panto. How did you get here? Well, you must have rubbed the lamp, mustn't you? Sometimes we find it doesn't take much of a rub. <laughs> Sometimes just the merest touch and then whoosh! <laughs> First night of our panto, it snowed, and he came out and said, hello, you know what I am? I hear, I'm here, I hear the six inches outside the stage door. He slipped in naughty innuendos all the time. I'm in the wings going, oh! <laughs> How does he get away with that? Julian's also gone back on the road, performing to packed houses with his most ambitious one-man show to date. His latest one-man show is, is about trying to find a, a husband. He pulls very poor, unsuspecting people out of the audience and then interviews them. For one of you, life is going to change overnight. You won't be able to walk in the morning. And eventually, he chooses one and marries them on stage. Thank you, and to think, by 2015, this won't all be a fantasy. It's quite something. The theme of the tour was Julian looking for a life partner. But off stage, he'd already filled the position with Ian, who he has been with for nine years. I really approve of Ian. I think they work very well together. Julian's very happy. I've never seen him happier than at this time of his life. Ian doesn't annoy Julian, you know. A lot of us do annoy him. The King of Camp has also gained the new title of Lord of the Manor at his country pile in Kent. He's very sort of like a country gentleman now. He's got his chickens and his hens. He's given the chickens names. One's called Kirsty and the other one's called Maureen. It's a real contrast to his, his life in London. Julian won an army of new fans when he was crowned reality TV champ on Celebrity Big Brother. Not in a million years would he have thought they'd win. I think he was, would have been genuinely shocked. You've made a 53-year-old homosexual very happy. What? You're a homosexual? I think it's been a brilliant thing for him. It's given him a little boost of confidence. He has this tremendous likability. Julian is a unique performer. Poor Justin. Spent 20 minutes combing his hair this evening, <laughs> and then he forgot to bring it with him. He can do a show that might seem a bit cheesy and bring his own unique personality to it. Does he learn from his mistakes? I hope not. Same-sex marriage is, is rapidly becoming yes. not only legal but fashionable. Do you have any plans to pop the question? I'm very keen on um, gay marriage. I think it's a, a very symbolic step. And, uh, and I don't know about myself. Um, I don't know about us. I, I think I'll wait till I'm asked. I mean, if Ian, if Ian went down on bended knee and popped the question, would you say yes? <laughs> because he's about to. <laughs> um, I would like um, 
to slip my finger into his ring. 